Okay, Steve, at the end of the last bit, you were you were talking about sudden events. I mean, what 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 do you mean by sudden events? A good, a, t a very unusual one, but an absolutely traumatic one for me was the change from on-course SPs to industrial SPs, which happened in the summer. That was an absolute bloodbath for me selling SPs. <laughs> absolutely. I actually stopped, burst, I basically stopped trading for about two months after July to let things settle down because my, I, I was, re again, as I said to you before, you have to realise when when it's you and when it's the thing and this time it was the thing all my models was you know all the results that were coming back in were saying something strange is happening here this is not like it was okay um, so you're talking about something strange happening my interpretation of that would be when they stopped obviously they had to stop returning the sp from on course bookmakers because there were none there and they're now being returned in a rather ambiguous manner from on course is that a fair summing up what happened was in the first five, four or five weeks of racing coming back, which was June to sort of through June, the number of long priced winners and long prices shot through the roof. So you were getting 100 to one winners, 125 to one winners, 65, 66 to one winners in profusion. Um, and the figures afterwards came back um, which I think the Horse Race Bets Forum, we dragged the figures out for that. The number of horses that won at those prices was phenomenally high. Um, and that was a correlate, I think, effect of two things. First, horses not being on the track for a while. Also, you got some odd results, but also the industrial SP pushed out the prices of long priced horses. So, oh, yeah, I absolutely caught a cold. I dropped six grand. I lost six grand in June. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mentioned the uh, horse race betters for you, you were me and you had a few sparring matches, uh, you know, online and whatever. You were quite a vocal um, critic, criticizer, I suppose, of racehorse bookmakers to a certain extent. Has your uh, opinion changed of them now? Um, I was, I think, on, on course bookmakers on mass are, are fine. Um, Unfortunately, certain parts of them were, as we we saw when we drew the figures out, were taking the Michael a little bit. Um, Foss Lass, and I will re-mention it again, I always do, Foss Lass were not serving their punters as well as they could do. And neither was Foss Lass Racecourse encouraging it or supporting it or not doing anything about it. And that was fine because there were other courses like Catrick, Cheltenham, who were doing wonderful work and giving the punters really good value and were doing really well. Uh, it, it's not something I particularly want to, you know, we want to go over now. I, it gave me the chance to meet lots of different bookmakers and be swore at by some and be unshaken by others. So it, it was quite good. And I even got a chance to be on a bookmaker's stand. So I was happy. Of course, uh, Foss, the Foss last margins have been eclipsed in recent uh, times when there was a, when there was a gamble running up. But um, would you say, would you say, just one more piece on this, that having now analysed the figures, compacting the front end of the market, seeing the, the other end of the race course, SPs were better value for punters than the current way they're doing it? I think in a way, the, the on-course SPs were more transparent in that you could actually see what were, you could actually see what was going on and i've sat with recorders when they've been doing it was one of the things i did was to sit with a recorder and learn how they did this um they are different and the if you back and i'll be fair totally fair if you back outsiders you are better off with the industrial s if you're betting at sp you're better off with the industrial sp because they do have some really long it's a bit like backing on the old tote you know the, the outsiders but if you're backing it at the front end of the market you may not be able to get that you may not be able to get such a good good margin um i think in the ideal world if it was going to be perfect you'd have a cross between the two you, you'd have the best of both worlds for punters but i i'm not confident that that's actually going to happen punters are at the bottom of the heap not the top okay right we'll go back in the spread betting now that I, I, you what would you say was the most important and hardest lesson you've learnt as a spread betting punter? To lose. Singularly, how to lose. That you can walk away 
from a bad day and come back the next day with the same with the same attitude as you had the first day. You you if you can do that, if you can do that to come back with the same attitude, not not trying to fight it back, not beating yourself up, but come back with the same attitude. That's the biggest. That's the single biggest thing that you can ever do. Uh, I've seen so many people go wrong because they they've panicked they've lost confidence in themselves they've started to try and do different things to dig themselves out in trouble no you've got to sit back and say that worked i've done that i know it's right i'm just going to carry on and we'll go through this but if you start yes. chasing losses you're, you're in trouble and what, what's alternatively what's the, the biggest rick that the market makers make that you love when you see it uh biggest rick i think my fate uh, just to give you a rick and this was a rick um i turned up worcester race course to to um go and watch got there for the first race noticed that we had some trainers wandering around the course prodding it in a rather suspicious ma rather unhappy manner i trotted off and i bought winning distances and i sold sps like fury they changed the going. There were 30 withdrawals. That was the biggest rip that I'd ever got involved in. I don't think the firms were too happy with me on that one, but I got the information. I could see what was going on here. You could see these trainers prodding this ground and thought, no, they're going to start taking them out. They withdrew 30 horses out of, out of days racing. So obviously the winning distances went through the roof. Okay, now I asked, I asked some people in spread betting, and one of them's come back with a question for you. This is, uh, they want to learn off of you, Steve. Do you think that uh, spread traders overbid winning distances and SPs? Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, it, when they say overbid, I think they mean they set the price slightly higher. I mentioned this earlier. People are more inclined to buy than they are to sell. It's more fun buying. Let me just give you a fun bet on buying. If you buy SPs, once you've cleared the total, so say you bought SPs for the, the, the meeting at 40 points. Once you've got 40 points of SPs, effectively you have your spread bet as a win bet on every other horse that wins, every other horse that wins. That's effectively what you've got. You have a free bet on every winner at that meeting left. That's a really good feeling. I very rarely do it, but um, I've done it and it's hilarious because you can stand in the stands cheering home winners because you've already backed them effectively. So yeah, uh, but yes, so people like like buying. So the firms have a tendency to put the buy price, a tendency to move the prices a little bit more up on the buy side. But conversely, selling is a harder job. Okay, now question, for you again the um people watching these videos have, we've done a lot of them now and successful punters everything they say makes a lot of sense you study the form you've got the statistics you've worked it all out you've, you've, you've but a lot of people do that and they still lose so they've got they do everything that you do but they still lose so what is the the killer sort of edge that you've got do you think that makes you the sort of person they don't really want to pick the phone up to when you ring compared to all the other people that must do their cobblers? Um, the, the, the trite answer is you've got to do it right. Um, you, you can do the same thing as me, but unless you do it right, it isn't going to work. But going away from the trite answer, I think when you're starting out, when you're doing it, when you're first doing it, and I think that the problems people get is that they, they, don't, they try and do it too quickly. It took me probably four or five years work to get into a, a proper winning, a winning way of doing things. So for the first four or five years, I was scratching around, but I still had to have the confidence that what I was doing was actually getting me where I wanted to go. The other problem you get is that it's easy to get sort of 80% skilled at something. If you work a bit harder, you can get 90% skill back. But it's that last going from 90 to 99% is a lot, a lot of work. Because they always say this, you need 10,000 hours in to be proficient at something. Whatever your skill set is, you need to put 10,000 hours in. And you do have to put the time, you do have to put the time in. And I think that that's the thing. And it is just, it's not difficult. It's just looking at what works and saying, right, that didn't work. Okay. 
I'm going to give it a bit longer, but eventually you used to have to go back and say, well, actually, I've tried that and it doesn't work, right? Let's go back again and try something else. And even revisit old ideas that you thought actually didn't work, that when you go back over and you think, well, actually, yeah, that does work. Just think about it and use your imagination a bit. What are, because it's no good doing what everyone else does. That's, that, you know, that applies to any form of betting. If you just back the favourites, if you back what everyone else does, you're not going to do any good. But if you can find that edge, that little niche, that little special bit that you can work with, you're away. Okay, so somebody's watching this now. That, that This is where you educate people. Somebody's watching it. Um, which would be the best market to dip your toe into if you're a novice, total novice, but you want to get involved? Okay, there, there is one. If you're already betting on horses, so let's say you're already betting on horses already, they do match bets. Now, what a match bet is, they will pick two horses in a race and they will put them together. So let's say, um, they say take two horses together and they will give a spread, which is the distance in length between them. And you have to bet which of those two horses is going to finish in front. Can be any, don't have to win the race. So let's say you add Quixel, Cross It and Red Rum in a race, hypothetically. I've just got two names there, two of my favourite horses. Um, you could, for example, look at those and you might think, well, Red Rum might do this flat race, might win by four lengths. So you, you might want to buy that. The spread betting firms have it set at two, for example. If it won by four, you would pick up twice your stake. On the other hand, if it lost, you would lose three or four times your stake. That's the way to do it. So start off with something that you know about, which is horses, because you know about horses, you're already betting on them. So you all you do is pick two horses, which of those two horses going to bet going to do best? See how you get on with that. If you can get 60% of those right, you're actually on the start, you might be on the start of something useful. Okay, and what about pitfalls to avoid? The the because we're running out of time, so the worst pitfall to avoid. Chasing losses. Do not chase your losses under any circumstances. Have a bank, keep to your stake regime, don't change things too often. Just sit tight and work your way through and don't go on any things that multiply together because unless you're really confident, the risk is gonna eat you. Okay, and the, the better the betting exchanges are the are the big you know the, the elephant in the room these days with uh, punting do you think that sports spread betting has had its day or has it never really been given a big enough push it's a very very it's a very very niche market and can be very difficult for, for punters to get started in you do have to give yourself plenty of time and start off with small stakes or paper trades and go through it. It's a good way of making money. I couldn't, I couldn't have made this money on the exchanges. I don't think. Uh, I might have done, but it, it, I, I probably haven't got the mentality for it. But you know, I think that the exchanges, you can bet on winning distances on the exchanges if you like, and you do it on fixed odds. Um, and I don't like it at all. So I stick to my spread bets. Okay, well, you need a few losers having bets with the spread betting company so you can get more on, I suppose. Uh, that's yeah i mean the spread betting firms have to try and attract people in and that's their job it's not my it's not my job to attract people in it's the spread betting companies that have got to market themselves to get people to do get people to go on these markets and that's up to them but it, it's a good way of doing it. it's a good i personally think it's a good way of betting because you're paid by the more right you are the more money you get simple as excellent and on that note steve tilly thank you very much Thank you.